God's Word. And I'm going to start Acts 16 and then take a break in the middle of it for my vacation. So I decided to do two what I call standalone sermons. And this week we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. So I ask you to turn your Bibles there to Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find this on page 811. And before we read God's word and hear it preached, let's go to our Lord and ask you to move our hearts and minds so we might rightly understand and receive that which he has for us. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you this morning thanking you and praising you, Lord, that you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your preached word. So it help us to see and understand rightly this command you have for us to be perfect. We know, Lord, we often don't think this way. So help us, Lord, to see how it is. Even now you are perfecting us. Lord, I ask you to be with me, your servant. Let the words that leave my lips, Lord, be not my own, but those you've placed in my mouth for the edification of your people, for showing that Christ highly exalted, and for bringing glory to your name. And Lord, I ask you to be with each one who's sitting here this morning. Help them, Lord, to be diligent and active listeners, to take a look at this word, Lord, this text you lay out before us, and to be asking, how can I put this into practice and live this out? Lord, we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43. Hear now God's holy and errant and infallible word. You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let me ask you a question. It's a really simple one. Are you perfect? As you hear that question, are you thinking to yourself, of course I am. Have you met me? Are you going the other direction and thinking to yourself, no way. I can't be perfect because nobody's perfect. I think most of us are inclined to go the way of the latter, to say we're not perfect. And I wonder, why are we so quick to say we're just like everybody else, imperfect? See, that's the problem we often have. We see ourselves as being imperfect, and this becomes the justification and excuse for all sorts of neglects, failings, and even sin. I mean, think about it. Don't aren't we quick to say, well, of course I did that. It's not like I'm perfect. What do you expect? But is that how we should be thinking, particularly when you consider that God doesn't just say, but he commands you to be perfect? What do you think as you hear that? Are you thinking, I've lost my mind, that can't be right? There's got to be some other meaning here? How could God expect me to be perfect when nobody's perfect? Well, if you're thinking that way, then what you want to do is pay careful attention this morning. Because you're going to see through this text how God not only commands you to be perfect, but he's going to show how even right now, Jesus Christ is in the process of perfecting you. I want you to follow along and unpack this text. And here's what you're going to see. Four points on the way to the big idea. You're going to see first, you're to love perfectly. Second, perfect love requires mercy. Third, mercy means more. And four, seek more than mediocrity. And this is going to bring us to the big idea. Here's the point of this text that you want to get down and try to live out. Perfect love requires Christ, who's perfecting you. So first, you're to love perfectly. When you think of that word love, when you think of the idea of love, who or what pops into your mind? Is it your spouse? Your children? Maybe that meal you love so much? How about that nasty neighbor or that co-worker that makes your job miserable? Do they pop into your mind when you think of love? Probably not. Because we don't usually think of love in the same context of those who make our lives miserable. We like to love those who love us and make our lives easy. But that's not quite what Jesus is getting at here, is it? He says something different. 
In fact, he starts out by saying that you're to hate your enemy. Look at verse 33. Look what it says here. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <clears throat> Don't you just want to cheer and give a hearty amen to that and say, yes, I knew it, I can hate my enemy. That's what they deserve. I mean, after all, how do we tend to gravitate toward when it comes to our enemies? How we can harm them, make their lives miserable, treat them the way they deserve. But you need to hold off your praise for just a minute. Because verse 43 begins our passage, but you need to understand the context of it. Well, it's the beginning of our passage. It's part of a much larger section of Scripture here. See, we're in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, and this passage is actually concluding what begins way back in verse 17, where Christ talks about how he came to fulfill the law. And he's driving home the point that if you want to rely on the law for your perfection, then you better make sure you're better than even the Pharisees and the scribes, who did what? They loved the law, and they sought to obey it perfectly. And that's why they said, hate your enemy. Now think about that. Jesus is saying something here that can be hard to hear, and we've got to ask, do you even see it in Scripture? I mean, does it actually say these things in Scripture? Well, the answer is yes and no. Because it does say you're to love your neighbor. That's what? That's Leviticus 19.18. But does it say to hate your enemy? Guess what? You're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. I mean, if you can find that, wouldn't that be most people's life verse? They say, that's the verse I love, I go to gravitate towards, hate my enemy. But what do you see in Scripture? You see passages that could lead you in that direction. I mean, after all, you've got Deuteronomy 7-2 that speaks of God, how he basically takes his enemies and serves on them complete destruction. You've got Deuteronomy 37 that speaks of God hating his enemies. And in Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, you know what God says? He says that he hates even the enemies of his people. So you take these passages about God's enemies and the enemies of his enemies, the enemies of his people, and how he hates them, and you juxtapose that against Leviticus 19.18 that says you're to love your neighbor, and you know what happens? Some people, Jews, particularly those living in the Qumran community, they took this to say, God is telling us loud and clear that we need to hate our enemies. And here's how the thinking works. They say in Leviticus 19.18, he says, love your neighbor. Then you got these other passages saying how God devotes his enemies to destruction and how he hates the enemies of his people. So what that means is you're to hate your enemies. Because if God wanted you to love them the same way you love your neighbor, why wouldn't he say it back in Leviticus 19.18? And that's how they concocted this thing that Jesus is saying You've heard it said. See, that's the tradition they held to. That was their teaching. That's why he says you've heard it said. But notice what Jesus does with that. He doesn't stop with what you've heard it said, but he goes on to say something else. Verse 43, you've heard it said. But verse 44, what does he say? But I say to you, love your enemies. Talk about a complete reversal of thought. And talk about Christ saying something that seems impossible to do. I mean, Jesus has just said, you're to love your enemies. And you know what this shows us? It shows us how love is so much more than just some warm or fuzzy feeling. It's even more than doing the right thing through gritted teeth. Because the idea that you need to actually show the kind of love that Jesus Christ himself shows to you. And how does Jesus Christ show his love for you? By going to the cross and dying to pay the price for your sins. Not giving you what you deserve, but showing you love by taking your penalty on himself. It's the idea of willingly laying down your life and your rights for the sake of another. Isn't this what we usually do for our spouses and our children? We won't go out of the way and do things for them that we don't usually do for other people, particularly not our enemies. But yet, what is Jesus saying right here? That that's what he wants you to do for not just your spouse, not just your children, not just your friends and those you like, but even those that you might consider your enemies. Because he's saying you need to show perfect love. Because you're to love perfect. Because he wants you to do just as he does for you. Which again 
is a willingness to go to the cross and die so you might live. And when did he do that? Not when you were his friend, not when you were loving him, but as it says in Romans 10.10, 10, or Romans 5.10, while you were yet his enemy. That's when he died for you, when you were his enemy. Mm -hmm. Because that, quite frankly, is how you show perfect love. It's the idea of loving the unlovable and showing kindness and generosity and mercy to not those who deserve it, but those who don't. Because as Christ commands you, you're to love perfectly. So let me ask you, is that how you love? Do you love everybody the same no matter what? Or do you treat people differently depending on how they treat you? You know, if somebody's good to you, then maybe you're good to them. But if they're not so good to you, then you don't quite treat them the same way, do you? You say, I'm going to treat you not so kind. But think about this. Jesus Christ. How did he treat you when you were his enemy? He went to the cross and died so you might live. He purchased your salvation by giving up his life. He lived a life of perfect obedience simply so he could go then and die as your perfect atoning sacrifice. That's what he did for you as his enemy. And he's saying that's what he wants you to do. So knowing that Jesus Christ did that for you, how could you possibly step back and say, I'm going to pick and choose who deserves my love? You need to think about something. I want you to do something for me right now. Think about that person. Get them in your mind. That person who can make your sunny days dark. That can take your smile and turn it upside down. That can make your life miserable just by being in your presence. Maybe it's that bully at work or at school. Maybe it's that sinner that always seems to get ahead by putting you down. Maybe it's that person who makes your life miserable. That person is your convinced God has put in your life just to remind you that suffering exists. I don't care where you're at or what situation you're in. I'm sure you've got at least one person who makes your life difficult, who makes your life miserable, who you might say, that's an enemy. I want you to get them in your mind. Think about them. And now... Go and love them perfectly. Because that's the person that Jesus says you're to love. That's how you show perfect love. And that's what Jesus commanded you to do. To love them perfectly. And he tells you how you can do this. Which brings us to our second point. Perfect love requires mercy. Jesus is taking the law and turning it on its head. He's showing how following the law means so much more than just external obedience. See, it's not just simply doing what he says. He's getting so much deeper than that. Because he's not after just your actions, but after your attitude. See, what it shows is the idea of not just being willing to do something for somebody, but actually having a heart attitude that wants to do good for them. Is that what you do? Do you think of those who cause you harm, cause you pain and misery, and say, how can I make their lives better and easier and more comfortable? That's not natural, is it? But yet that's what Jesus is after right here. And this shows us how when we think about our enemies, we need to move beyond justice, beyond thinking what they deserve, and move on to mercy. Thinking about what they don't deserve. See, loving perfectly as we're commanded to do, it transcends us and takes us into the supernatural. Because it causes us to rely not on ourselves, but on Jesus Christ, His power, and His Spirit. And that's because on our own strength and our own fleshly desires, we love justice, not mercy. <clears throat> Think about when somebody harms you, when somebody commits some grievous sin. You see people in the streets doing what? Demanding justice. We want justice. You don't see people rallying together and saying, we demand mercy. Give us mercy. Show him mercy. You don't see that, do you? That's not us. That's supernatural. That's what God does. And that's why Jesus commands you to do what you need to do if you're going to show people mercy. That's why he says you need to pray. He says you need to pray for your enemies. Because if you're going to have any hope of loving your enemies, loving them perfectly as Christ commands you to do, then it's going to begin with you praying for them. Because there's no way you can actually seek the good of one who seeks your harm, 
your discomfort, to make your life miserable, even to see your demise come about without God's supernatural help. So that's why Jesus tells you here in verse 44b to pray for those who persecute you. And this persecution language, it puts your enemy into perspective. It shows you this is not just a person who's neglectful or maybe not kind to you, maybe makes your life a little bit more difficult, but this is somebody completely different. This is somebody who goes out of their way to make your life difficult and to harm you. It's the person who intentionally and purposely seeks to bring about your pain, your agony, and your suffering. It's much like those of Jesus' day. Think about the leaders of Jesus' day. They saw him as an enemy. So what did they do? They accused him, fought against him, challenged him, resisted him, even plotted his death. And even that wasn't enough. Because they had to beat him, mock him, scorn him, hang him on a cross. And while he was dying, what did they do? They continued to make fun of him and mock him. We talk about kicking a guy when he's down. And what does Jesus do? Does he curse them? Does he say, God's going to come and get you? No. He does just what he tells you to do. He prays for them. While he's dying on the cross, he prays to his heavenly Father, forgive them. Don't hold their sin against them. Because they know not what they do. See, Jesus is showing you first and foremost what it is you're supposed to do for your enemies. To pray for them. Because that's what you need to do if you're going to change your attitude. See, that's what it means. That's what it takes to love your enemies. That's why you need to be in prayer daily, regularly, constantly. Because if you have any hope of loving your enemies, it takes supernatural help. It takes the power of God, of His Spirit to indwell you. Because notice what Jesus says to pray for. Not for yourself. He doesn't say pray you'll have the right attitude. Pray you'll get a good opportunity. He says pray specifically for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. And that's because it's hard to be nice and kind and do the right thing to somebody who is coming against you, attacking you, speaking bad about you, trying to bring you down, ruin you. To do that, you need to have a totally different perspective. And that's what prayer does for you. It changes your perspective. It puts your heart, your mind, and your attitude in a whole different place. Because it causes you to think not what's being done to you, but rather what God has done for you. How he sent you his son to die while you were his enemy. So you can now do the same and pray for your enemies, asking that God might do the same for them that you might be able to intentionally seek the good of others, praying that God might bring them to salvation, change their heart and their attitude as well. And that's why you need to pray. Because what Jesus is saying to do here is so contrary to what the world says. When somebody's harming you, treating you unfairly, what does the world tell you? Don't they say you don't deserve that? You don't deserve to be treated that way? Don't put up with that. Don't let them treat you that way. Don't let them walk all over you. You need to show them who's boss. That's what the world says. But what is Christ saying? Something entirely different. He says to pray for them. Pray for your enemy. Pray for their good. And notice what he says why you should do so. So that you can be God's child. Do you get that? Look at verse 45. Look what he says here. So that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. See, this so there is giving you the reason why you can love and pray for your enemies. So you might become God's children. So that takes you back to everybody saying, whoa, 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 what is Jesus saying here? Is Jesus laying out for me a works theology? Is he saying I need to do something? Well, that's his point. Is yes, you need to love your enemies, you need to pray for your enemies, but it's something that you cannot do on your own. Through this language, Jesus is reminding you of your need for Jesus Christ. If you've got any hope of doing what Christ says you're to do, then you must turn and trust in Him. And this drives home how perfect love requires mercy. Because it's through God's mercy that you've been united to Jesus Christ. It's why you don't get what you deserve. It's why you don't experience the wrath that your sins deserve. But instead, you get God's love shed upon you through the personal work of Jesus Christ. And what it's saying is, 
Because you've been united to Jesus Christ, that means you're now different. You've been changed, which means you now have to live differently now. You need to live as the child of God that you are. You realize that? You're united to Jesus Christ, and you're adopted as his son and his daughter. That's a good thing to hear. Christ loves you so much that he dies so you might be adopted into his family. And just like you do with your children, Jesus is saying the same thing God does with his children. What do you do with your kids? Don't you tell them there's a certain standard they need to live by, a certain way you expect them to behave? Because they're your child, they're a career, they're a developing. You don't do that with the neighbor's kids, do you? You do it with your children. And God does the same with his children. He says, this is the way you're to behave. This is the way you're to live. But he does something even more. He enables you to do it by giving you his son and giving you his spirit. Because it's through Jesus Christ and his spirit that you get God's grace and his mercy. And it's God's mercy that keeps you from receiving God's wrath that you rightfully deserve. And it's in this fact that you see how perfect love requires mercy. Because perfect love doesn't give someone or focus on what they deserve, but it focuses on giving them mercy. How you can do for them what they don't deserve. It's just what God does with his children and with his enemies alike. Look how verse 45 ends. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. You see that word for? That's showing you how God shows you what it looks like to show love to your enemies. It's basically a picture of God's common grace or universal mercy that bestows his blessing and goodness and kindness on all of his creation. It's painting a picture for you of how you see mercy in the midst of perfect love, what it looks like. It's bestowing good gifts, not just on those who deserve it, but even those who don't. Those who love you and those who hate you. And we sometimes miss this in our modern world because the language is used here. It talks about God's sun shining down and then pouring down the rains. And we think, okay, what's the big deal with that? Well, think about the context here. This is a period of time where you depended on the growth of your food to eat. I'm going to shock you here, but food is not manufactured in a warehouse and just put on the supermarket you know, shelves. People have to grow food. That's how you eat. That means God needs to give his sun and his rain to flow down so food will grow and you won't starve to death. But the reality is this. That's what God does for all his creation. Notice the language that says his son and the rain. That's reminding you of who God is. He's not just the great creator of all things. He's also the sustainer of all life. And how does he sustain your life? By giving you what you need. And he doesn't say, well, okay, you're no good. You don't deserve it. You're okay. I'll let you eat. No, he gives it to everyone. And that's an example of how you see mercy in the midst of perfect love. And that's what he wants you to do with everyone. Because God doesn't have to do this. Understand, you were God's enemy. You resisted him and fought against him. And he died for you. United you to Jesus Christ. And what happens? You still go on saying, I'm not perfect. Of course I'm going to sin. And what does God do? He still provides for you and cares for you and meets all your needs. He doesn't give you the wrath and death you deserve. Because quite frankly, every one of us deserves to die through starvation. But God continues to feed us. And he shows us through that what perfect love looks like. How it shows mercy. And he says, that's what you need to do as well. Because mercy means so much more than just doing like everyone else. And that's what God is doing here. He's showing all his creation, his mercy. The rain is coming down on everyone. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't rain down fire and judgment, but he sends the rains so the crops will grow. He doesn't send the sun out to burn up the earth, but he sends it to warm it so you'll have food. You'll be provided for it. See, the good and the wicked alike receive blessings and mercy rather than wrath. And that's part of mercy. Think about it. God withholds his immediate judgment, doesn't he? Because he gives you an opportunity. 
to continue to grow and turn to Him. If you're sitting here this morning as one who's not yet committed your life to Christ, well, now's your opportunity. Because God is withholding His judgment, but He's not going to do it forever. It may happen this afternoon. It may happen tomorrow morning. It may happen next week. Because God has an end to His mercy. Because it's followed by His judgment. But right now we're seeing God's mercy because the epitome of His mercy is withholding His judgment and not giving you what you need, giving you the opportunity to turn. And it shows you how perfect love requires mercy. And this shows you how mercy takes us beyond the norm. It's, more than, it's doing more than just what's customary. Which brings us to our third point. Mercy means more. The biblical view of mercy is forbearance, long-suffering. It's the idea of not getting what you deserve. And the why that takes place is because of who God is. He's a merciful God. He tells you that himself. Exodus 34, 6. God speaking about himself. What does he declare? He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. In Psalm 86, 15, David is writing about God. What does he say? But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And Paul the Apostle writes the exact same thing in Ephesians 2, 4, when he writes, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. What is Paul driving home there? You see God's mercy through the love he shows you by sending his son to die so you might live. Giving you not what you deserve, but what you don't. Giving you his grace. These passages and so many more in Scripture show how God is a merciful God who loves you. So he doesn't give you what you deserve, but he gives you what you need. And he says, that's what you are likewise to go and do now. Because you're his child, you're to live like your father does. And you see this in Luke 6.36 where Jesus says, be merciful even as your father is merciful. This makes clear that you're to show mercy just as your heavenly father does. And this means it's not enough to show mercy just to those who love you, those who are kind to you, or those who can repay you in some fashion. But you need to go above and beyond that. Don't do just like everybody else, but do more. Go and show mercy to those who don't like you, even those who hate you, those who are unkind to you, those who make your life miserable, those who could never pay you back, those who don't deserve it. See, that's what Jesus is getting at here with this language of, tax collectors and pagans. Because it's saying you're living in a way not like the rest of the world, but in a way that shows forth the type of mercy your heavenly Father shows. Look at verses 46 and 47. Look what he says here. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even Gentiles do the same? These are powerful words that drive home how mercy means more than the minimum. It's not enough to be nice, kind, loving, and forgiving to those you know, those you like, or those you get some benefit from. True mercy is seen when it's shown to the lowest of society. That's why Jesus here is speaking of tax collectors and Gentiles. They were seen as the unclean scum of the earth. I mean, think about who tax collectors were. These were fellow Jews who had the audacity to go to work for the Roman Empire and collect unfair taxes on their own people. And what would they do? They wouldn't just take what they were supposed to. They would take more to line their own pockets. And Jesus says, even they treat their neighbors and relatives good. So if you do so, so what? And think about Gentiles. They were so unclean, you couldn't even get near them without becoming defiled. And yet Jesus is saying, even they are good to their children, their spouses. So if you do likewise, so what? Even the worst people in the world do that. Don't, don't pat yourself on the back for doing like everyone else. But you need to do more of what Jesus is saying. Because mercy means more. It's going above and beyond. It's showing mercy not just to those who deserve it, but especially to those who don't. And this again is why you need Jesus Christ. Because on your own, you could never do this. But through Jesus Christ, you've got the power and the ability to do so much more. 
Because you'll never show mercy on your own strength. But through Jesus Christ, through his power, you're empowered to go forth and actually live as you're called to do. To actually show the same type of mercy your Heavenly Father does. To show it even to those who hate, despise, and persecute you. That's what Jesus Christ does for you. And when you do that, you show everybody around how mercy means more. And this means we all need to be after so much more. Which brings us to our fourth and final point. Seek more than mediocrity. Jesus is laying out through this text how loving your enemies means imitating God's mercy. The same mercy that he shows to the world, you need to do. That's part of loving your enemies. It makes clear so much more than doing just like everybody else. You're not to be content with simple mediocrity, but you need to strive for so much more. You need to hear Jesus' words here saying, you're commanded to seek more than mediocrity. That's what he's driving home in how the text ends. Look at verse 48, which wraps our text up. It says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. See, your heavenly Father is perfect. You're to be just like your heavenly Father, which means you're to be perfect. Notice the therefore. See, a therefore is always there to show you what something's there for. It's the reason for something. It's like when you say, the pastor can't serve communion this morning because he broke his rib. You know what's going on. The same thing's going on here with Jesus. He's saying why you're to love your enemies. Because it's how you show that you're perfect, just like your heavenly Father is perfect. And when you love your enemies the way you're supposed to, you're showing that you're on the path, taking the first step toward your perfection. And why do I say first step? Because that verb there, to be... It says you're to be perfect. It's a future tense verb, functioning and paratidal. Now, what does that mean in simple English? It means it's a present day command with a future fulfillment. It's like when mom says, you're going to school tomorrow. You know where you're going to be tomorrow, right? You're going to be in school. She's saying it today, but it's going to happen tomorrow. That's what's happening here. A present command that's going to be fulfilled. And that's how you want to understand your own perfection. This command that you're to be perfect is not a present reality, but it's a guarantee. And this is why you can love your enemy. Because you know where you're headed. You know the path you're on. You don't have to say, they're not treating me so good, so i got to treat them the same way. You can say, I've been treated better, so I can treat them better, because I'm on the path to perfection. And understand, this command it's not just a command, but it's also a promise. That's why it's also future. It's a promise that even right now, you're being perfected as you seek to live out Christ's commands. It's saying you can have the hope of doing what Christ commands you to do. Because Jesus Christ, even right now, is in the process of perfecting you. Think of it this way. You're a work in project, a work in progress. Think about that artwork. You ever see that artwork that's worth millions? You think, wow, that's beautiful, that's amazing. You realize it doesn't start out that way. It usually starts out quite messy. Maybe like a lump of clay or a block of stone. You're thinking, what is this? That looks like trash. But after it's molded and shaped and worked on, what happens? It becomes perfect. It's this priceless perfection that's created. And that's you. That's what Jesus Christ is doing with each and every one of his people right now. And that's why... You don't want to resolve yourself to the idea that I am not perfect. But you want to seek more. Seek more than mediocrity. Because doing this means you're looking not just at the present, but also at the past and the future. It's just like we do at the Lord's Supper. What happens when we celebrate the Supper? What do we see? We get a picture, a reminder, not just of what Christ is doing today, but what he's already done in the past. How he died so you might live. How he offered himself up to purchase your pardon. And it also reminds you how he's dwelling you even right now, continuing to help you to walk along his paths to where you're headed, to the future. What your future holds. And it's bright and it's glorious. That's what you see in the supper, and that's what you're seeing here in this text. So don't see yourself as flawed and full of imperfections, but see yourself as Christ does. 
One who's been perfected and has great value. See, you can't say you're imperfect because you're a child of the king. You're a color of Christ. If you say you're imperfect, that means you took Christ's perfection. Somehow tarnish it. You think you could do that? No, you can't do that. It works the opposite way. Christ takes your imperfection and perfects it by giving you his perfect righteousness. Imputing to you his righteousness so you're perceived as perfect in God's eyes. Is that how you see yourself? So change your thinking. Don't say, I'm just like everybody else, I'm not perfect. But say, I'm a child of the king. I'm perfected. That's where I'm headed. See, what this says for you is, you're so much more than the average Joe. So brothers and sisters, seek more than mere mediocrity. Our passage this morning is a command to love your enemies so you'll be perfect like your heavenly father. And I know this can be a lot to take in. You can hear this and get overwhelmed, discouraged, and say, there's no hope for me. Because I know how I am. I know what I think. I know what's in my heart. I've got no hope of being perfect. And on your own, you don't. But with Jesus Christ, you know where you're headed. It's the journey you started. Think of it this way. Think about taking a walk around the globe. Think about Dave Koontz, who on June 20th, 1970, took the first step in what began a four-year three-month, 16-day, almost 15,000-mile trek across the entire globe. He's the first recorded man we know to have basically walked the entire landmass of the earth. And he started with one step and followed it with 20 million steps more. And through this journey, he experienced highs and lows, good weather and bad, storms beating down on him, sunshine scorching him. He saw hardships and struggles. He had people be kind to him and bless him, and he had people terrorize him. He even saw his brother killed in Afghanistan. But you know what he did? He kept moving towards his goal. And that shows you commitment, determination, resolve to complete a journey. And that's what you want to think about as you think about your journey towards perfection. The commitment, the determination, and the resolve it takes to keep moving forward. Because here's the reality. Perfection doesn't happen overnight, and it's not something you'll see in this lifetime. But it's where you're headed. So when someone asks you, are you perfect, don't be so quick to say, no, I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect. But when they ask, are you perfect, give them the right answer. Are you perfect? Not yet, but I'm on my way. That's what you want to let them know. Brothers and sisters, perfect love requires Christ, who's perfecting you. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning thanking you and praising you. Because through this text of Scripture, Lord, we see how you don't only command us to be perfect, but you give us that promise that you're even perfecting us now. So we ask that you continue to do so, Lord. Help us to live as you call us to do, by not just loving those who love us, Lord, but loving our enemies, seeking to show good, and ask for your blessing upon all those around us. Lord. Help us to truly be sons and daughters of Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.